Welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Mark Green, President and CEO. And I'm really excited to welcome my former colleague, Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson, Chairwoman of the Committee on Science, Space and Technology, to one of the most interesting events we've ever hosted at the Center. Called Esports and Education, How HBCUs Are Leveling the Field, this event is a showcase of the Ed Games Expo. The Expo is the Department of Education's annual public celebration of game-changing innovations in education technology. We are proud to showcase it and the Wilson Center's research on this topic, the only think tank in Washington with a serious games initiative. Right now, over 200 colleges and universities in the U.S. have an eSports program, and more campuses every day are expanding their programming from extracurricular clubs to academic support of eSports. Historically, black colleges and universities are seizing this opportunity for innovation and new horizons in workforce development. They're building spaces on campus for eSports, providing not only opportunities for students to play and build communities, but also to learn critical skills in STEM and beyond. Many thanks for this event go to the director of the Wilson Center's Serious Games Initiative, Dr. Elizabeth Newberry. She's not only our resident games expert, developing games on topics ranging from the federal budget to ocean plastics, but she's also passionately researching the global impact of esports and the way it is driving education. I'd like to thank the Department of Education for once again allowing the Wilson Center to host a showcase on this global issue, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers for being here. We appreciate also the technical expertise that Community, Microsoft, and the White House Initiative on HBCUs provided for this event. But most of all, I want to thank all of you for joining us here at the Wilson Center today. I hope you have fun. Thank you all so much for your patience. I, it's my honor here to introduce Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. Thank you so much. Well, let me thank you very much for the invitation. And I'd like to thank Ambassador Green and the Wilson Center uh, and, and all of the uh, esteemed speakers for their efforts to create a more diverse and equitable science and technology sector in our nation. As chair of the Committee of Science, Space, and Technology, uh, I am focused on ensuring that the U.S. is poised to lead the world in science and innovation. I apologize for my voice. I'm in Texas where we've had rain for the last month off and on, and, and my uh, allergies are up. But um, I am committed to ensuring that we have a STEM workforce that we need to address both outstanding and emerging societal challenges like social and economic uh, equity, climate change, threats to our national security and our democracy. We only have to review where we are now uh, to see the value of federal investment in research and critically the importance of having a STEM workforce ready to answer the call when disaster strikes. A major factor in developing a STEM workforce that can meet needs for the American people is ensuring that STEM workforce mirrors the diversity of American people. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, STEM occupants are projected to grow over two times faster uh, than the total of all the occupations in the coming decade. That's why it's so critical that we put emphasis on diversity and equity and equal opportunity uh, because the STEM workforce will hold us back in this nation if we are not ready. Businesses are struggling to find employees with STEM knowledge right now and with looking for the skills that they need. Some people will not return to jobs after this virus because of the advancement 
of that's being made every day for the needs of the workforce and the readiness. The lack of diversity has also resulted in many technological innovations that have ignored the needs of marginalized communities and artificial intelligence is coming into force. And so with these technological innovations that are coming about now, we know can harm our communities if we are not ready. So fortunately, the HBCUs are leading the charge in educating and training Black students and critically needed STEM skills. Though I'm not a graduate of HBCUs, uh, HBCU, as long as I have been on this committee, I've worked very hard every chance I've had to give attention uh, to the areas. Why? Because HBCUs make up only 3% of the nation's colleges and universities, but they graduate 32% of the African-American students earning bachelor's degrees in the physical sciences, 29% in mathematics, and 27% in biological sciences. One third of all black students who have earned doctorate degrees have a bachelor's degree from an HBCU. So yes, it is very important that we look very strongly at enhancing uh, our black colleges, because we know that that's where our students really feel confident. HBCUs are paving the way for broadening participation in STEM and stand poised to play a major role in expanding opportunities for students through educational technologies and esports. Esports constitute a rapidly growing industry in science and technology sector, with revenues expected to grow to $1.1 billion in 2021. Well-designed esports programs and HBCUs can contribute to increasing the student re recruitment and retention. They also can be leveraged to promote STEM learning and serve as a gateway to a career in coding, programming, and game design. In this community that I serve, the jobs that are available overwhelmingly available in these areas, but routine past majors are having difficulty finding jobs. So I'm excited to hear more about today's speakers about the work that HBCUs are doing to build esports programs that will empower students to reach their full potential. We must join in making sure that our students are ready. The world is not going to come around us. We've got to lead it. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we stay on top of this. We didn't hear that much about a group of black women that helped to make the first launch into space successful. We have not heard very much about it being a black man that helped the light bulb burn after Edison came up with the light bulb and had to make it stay on. We have not heard very much about the three black teenagers in Pennsylvania that brought forth the driverless car. We've got to acknowledge those contributions and add more to it. So thank you very much for what you're doing. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Well, thank you so much for that, Congresswoman. We really appreciate that. And um, I, I know that we likely have several questions coming out from the chat and we can relay them to you after the event, if that's OK. Uh, thank we have you. That's fine. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Well, great. Um, now we're going to after that wonderful introduction on the state of play with uh, esports and the importance with integrating it with HBCUs, I'm going to provide a little bit of an overview here, if uh, my system will allow. One moment, please. Great. So welcome again to the Wilson Center. 
Uh, my name is Elizabeth Newberry and I'm the director of the Serious Games Initiative here at the, the Wilson Center. This event is part of the 2021 and 8th Annual Ed Games Expo. And one of the things I would encourage you is that if you are interested in taking this conversation beyond this event, to take it to the hashtag uh, on Twitter. Uh, so again, uh, just amplifying and uh, engaging beyond this particular event. Uh, the Wilson Center uh, is a think tank based in Washington, D.C., founded by Congress, so we're a federal instrumentality that is a living memorial to President Wilson, the only uh, president with a Ph.D. And one of the things that we do is we really amplify critical discourse to policy issues. So today we're talking about esports, but other issues that my program covers are uh, issues around how do we uh, engage beyond education? How do we get people into the conversation around uh, political issues and discourse? So the ambassador mentioned the federal budget. We have a game about that. Um, one of the more exciting topics from a DC perspective, maybe less so for the average person, but we've had 3 million people play our game, the games, the budget hero and fiscal ship, which you can play now at fiscalship.org uh, on the federal budget and you too hopefully can uh, steer us out of national debt. But today I'm here to talk about uh, one of the other capacities that I am very passionate about here. Um, and part of that is informed by my uh, studies before coming to the Wilson Center. So directly before coming to the Wilson Center, I was a graduate student at Cornell University. And one of the things that I tackled through my uh, PhD program is esports. Largely, one of the things I did was I had to explain to my advisors why people would watch other people playing video games on the internet. Now, this is a little while ago. I didn't have the, the robust economics to back me up, but one of the things that we're I'm continually interested in is how people are engaging in this phenomenon known as esports. So I'm going to provide a little bit of an overview so we're all on the same page, at least roughly of what esports is and then talk a little bit more intimately about esports and education. Um, before I dive any further though, I wanna make sure to take this time to thank several of the people who were instrumental in getting this event off the ground. So first of all, I would like to thank the ambassador and the Congresswoman for joining us here today and kicking off the conversation. I'd also like to thank my colleague at the Department of Education, Ed Metz, for orchestrating the entire Ed Games Expo in week worth of games, education, technology, and other wonderful products coming out of the federal government that support the broader educational technology and uh, ecosystem. And I'd also like to thank uh, for her technical assistance, uh, my colleague Sadika Franklin, who will be hearing on the first panel um, from the White House Initiative on HBCUs. And I'd also like to thank very, very, uh, deeply uh, John Cash from Johnson C. Smith University, who was a uh, paramount to getting this program into the shape that it's in. A lot of the, the work and behind the scenes efforts, this, this event would not be what it is without uh, his support. And speaking of uh, behind the scenes efforts, I'd like to thank the team at Microsoft, uh, Renata, Josh, and Maria, who are instrumental in getting this uh, event into the format that we're talking about now, as well as the Minecraft uh, initiative that we're going to be seeing later on. That all being said, thank you guys so much also for being here. I really appreciate your time. Now, let's talk a little bit about esports. First of all, what is esports? Uh, this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind, so if there's any questions afterwards, I'm always happy to uh, engage and uh, explain deeply, more deeply in the chat, for example, after this particular uh, little address. But esports, most broadly speaking, is the competitive play of video games. It's not just sports video games, but it's taking any video game really and turning it into a sport. So turning it into a competition or something along those lines. You can see here a picture of an arena. Um, that uh, was featured a, a major tournament, for example, where people are packing into what you might normally associate with the local basketball team or the, or the like. 
uh, watching other people playing video games. It's also a global phenomenon, and we won't talk about that as much here at this particular event since we're talking about HBCUs, but it's something to bear in mind that this is not just happening in the United States, that it really is having a broad, broad impact around the world. There's, there's two characteristics that I want to emphasize also about esports. One, the competitions often manifest in the forms of tournaments. So there's a lot of emphasis in esports on playing to tournaments, so playing against other people for uh, pots of money and that sort of thing. And the other thing is that esports often happens very, 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 very much on live streams. So during the pandemic, esports has actually flourished where other sports may not have done as well this particular past year. Um, and part of that is because it's the way it's consumed. It's consumed through live streaming. So uh, you'll hear a lot about Twitch and those sorts of platforms for esports. But beyond the tournament and the, the um, ways that people consume them, one of the things that makes esports unique is also the professionalization of esports. And there's a lot of emphasis on the professionalization of the play experience itself. So people who are paid or practice and work on teams to compete against each other across video games. Um, and the other thing that I mentioned earlier is that one of the things that these players are competing for is uh, often prize pools, but sometimes they also have uh, salaries and that sort of thing, and that's a growing uh, event. Um, but in any case, you can hear both uh, players at a tournament itself as well as um, ones that are, are winning a prize pool. But I like to take the lens a little bit farther away from the professional players and look at other things that make it a unique and interesting uh, component. So here you can see a screenshot of a Twitch stream. And one of the things that we see here is that there's a professionalization of casters and reporters and the broadcast itself that really makes esports what it is. So it looks very uh, uh, on the surface like something you would see on ESPN. The other thing that makes it really interesting is the uh, burgeoning uh, economics that support esports. So in 2020, according to a Forbes report, the esport market estimates were around 495 million. As the Congresswoman pointed out, that's going to explode very likely uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to emphasize here is the 3.1 billion hours of that are spent uh, watching esports. So 214 million revenue, 495 million people watching it. And they're all spending about 20 hours a week watching esports, at least that's the average. So it's a very, very growing industry. There's also a growing engagement across uh, government uh, in esports. And here I've, I've pointed out some of the, the military engagement in the space. Some are using it as a recruitment tool and others are investing in programs at college campuses that really are supporting the STEM pipeline. So here you see a, a clip of Hampton University received a grant from the DOD to help create an esports space and an esports ecosystem on campus. Esports is largely not going away. It's about uh, technological innovations that are, there are lots of technological innovations that over the next couple of years are going to probably see extensive growth. So for example, we hear a lot of conversations around the expansion of broadband and 5G within the United States. And these are going to have direct impacts on the industry, uh, not only improving the play experience, uh, so lower latencies and that sort of thing, but also potentially broadening the uh, platforms that are available on to play. So, for example, VR, AR, mobile gaming, those might be more um, uh, possible in the future. Uh, despite this growth. One of the things, though, I'd like to emphasize is that it's also still a very much emerging field and how to do esports is very much in flux. One of the things that I would point to is that there's a lot of ambiguity about what games are considered an esport. So is it just the top four titles on Twitch or are, is it a more expansive definition? And what we're seeing from a lot of educational spaces is that that expansive definition can bring in a lot of really unique audiences. So if you have an esports program that's not just League of Legends or CSGO, but maybe Just Dance is part of it, it 
builds a more inclusive uh, atmosphere there. Speaking of esports and education, one of the things that we uh, often ask ourselves is what is the current state of play in education? And I'd like to think of this in two discrete categories. One is the play component. So how are students orienting towards uh, campuses here? Uh, and then the academic component. So how are colleges and universities building programs around esports that are really trying to um, facilitate educational outcomes? For the play experience, we often see play enacted on college campuses through club esports, varsity esports, and league play, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. But then we're also seeing on the other side of it more formalization of academic programs. So how can students engage in the business of esports? How can we increase STEM uh, products around esports? So esports being a computer-based technology product is very much in lends itself to STEM and a couple of our panelists will talk a little bit more about that. But there are also uh, growing academic concerns around esports and programs that are trying to negotiate those concerns. So, uh, for example, we have esports and law, which a couple of my colleagues uh, work over there at George Washington University on that issue. And there's also esports health. So creating programs around physical health that might support esports. Uh, there's a little bit more about that on the Wilson Center's website, which I'll link to in a second. But um, one of the things that we see here is uh, also a rise in collegiate leagues. There are a growing number of organized leagues in esports, and here I've come up with a sample of the different types of leagues. One is uh, the leagues that are uh, formed from the individual uh, developers. So Blizzard, for example, has a league called TESPA that engages around 40,000 students. And then there's also leagues that are coming more out of traditional sports leagues. So divisions of or parts of traditional sports leagues in colleges. Really to understand how to do esports, though, one of the things I would say is you have to look at where esports is happening on campus. So there's spaces for play that are not professional um, to uh, in, in the esports broader world. Here's two examples from my 2015 uh, field site observations. One is more of a land center, um, which has a game set up, and then the other is a more of an informal pack and play where people bring the equipment necessary to an actual physical building. We're seeing a more of the former in college spaces where colleges are building what they're calling arenas to facilitate esports. The benefit that a lot of colleges are hooking onto here with the arenas is really trying to make sure that these are spaces that are dual use. So they're not just for the play of esports, but they're also supporting academic um, uh, issues. So, for example, uh, there are very expensive computers in a lot of these esports arenas, and using those computers not just for the esports play, but also for classes and that sort of thing could, could really benefit from high-grade computers. It would be a minor disjustice, to, though, to say that this is all golden opportunities on campuses, particularly when it comes to the play of esports. We're seeing some concerns growing around the inclusivity of esports. This is a self-perpetuating cycle where we design esports programs or we design video games that are for particular audiences. So, for example, there's a lot of research that looks at the gender inclusivity of video games. We're seeing this spill over into esports where there's a lack of gender diversity when it comes to scholarships for playing rosters. A recent AP study, for example, pointed out that there are nearly 90% of esports scholarships going to men in one particular league. Uh, this is also very true for other forms of diversity and inclusion. There's a lot of interest in trying to look at those. And one of the things I would challenge us to consider as we go through this program today is how do we make esports more inclusive? There's a lot of siloing effects with particular game genres and particular gaming communities. 
And thinking beyond what we have currently will really, I think, help us build more inclusivity in esports. How do we expand the titles that are available? How do we expand the conversations, the ways that we're doing esports? <coughs> Within the HBCU context, sorry, uh, 67 out of 107 e uh, HBCUs have esports programs. <clears throat> this was a quick sample that we did at the Wilson Center of publicly available information on esports at HBCUs. So if you are here and you run an esports program at an HBCU or interested, one of the things that we're offering after this particular panel is a write up and report on the state of play for HBCUs and esports as a way to better understand the broader landscape of esports integrating with education. Now, I mentioned before that there's play and then there's academic integration of esports on educational campuses. And one of the interesting things about HBCUs is that they're also embracing this idea of pipeline support. So it's not just restricted to how do I get academic engagement on my campus, but it's also how do I engage the broader community of play and younger students in esports and through esports to try to facilitate that pipeline. <clears throat> and hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that again from our experts and leaders in this space. So as just as a quick mapping of today, we're going to have two panels and two play sessions. The first panel is going to be looking at how different uh, universities are orienting towards esports and how they're building uh, programs on campus. The second one is going to be more about how this is integrating specifically with academic success on campus. And then uh, one of the things I wanted to do is not just tell you what esports is, but also we wanted to show you what esports is. So we have two different play sessions, one presented by Microsoft and one presented by Community that will also walk you through and show you actual play of esports because it's one thing to, for me to describe and show you pictures it's a completely other thing to actually see it in action as it were one of the things i would encourage you to do is that after today to keep the conversation going uh, there will be video available after this event and then the wilson center will also again be writing up a report that we'll send out to everyone who rsvp'd and one of the things that we're going to be looking for is major themes across these different panels, but also ways that we can help uh, amplify and in understand research directions for esports. I'd like to thank you again for being here. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists, and I can't wait to get started.